The Stanford Prison Experiment was a study in social psychology that investigated the psychological effect of power. It took place at Stanford University, California, on the 14th to the 20th of August, 1971. A group of researchers, led by Professor Philip Zimbardo, conducted the experiment on volunteer college students, assigning them to roles as either guards or prisoners, depending on the toss of a coin. Zimbardo himself presided as the superintendent of the supposed prison. Originally scheduled for two weeks, the resulting study was a controversial and disturbing fiasco that revealed the dark side of the human psyche. The study was funded by the U.S. Office of Naval Research after problems between guards and prisoners in U.S. Navy prisons. Investigating the power of roles, rules, symbols and group identity, it quickly degenerated into a sadistic and authoritarian power game, reinforcing the uncomfortable truth that ordinary people can easily be led into reprehensible behaviour and that the recipients of that behaviour will, for the most part, passively accept it. The 24 male participants were selected by test. Only those who were considered mentally stable and those without a criminal background were considered. Conducted in a 35-foot section of a basement at a university psychology building, the 12 prisoners were held in 6 by 9 feet cells, 24 hours a day, whilst the 12 guards lived in a different area, with rest and relaxation. Nine prisoners and nine guards were active, with a further three prisoners and guards as potential substitutes. A research assistant took on the role of a warden, alongside Zimbardo's superintendent. In an orientation for the guards, Zimbardo asserted that while the guards could not be violent or withhold food and drink, they could instill a degree of fear and powerlessness aimed at stripping the prisoners of all individuality. The guards wore uniforms, carried batons, and wore sunglasses to prevent eye contact, while the prisoners wore rough, ill-fitting smocks, as well as an ankle chain. Guards only referred to prisoners by a number. The Palo Alto Police Department assisted the study by conducting simulated arrests and processing of the prisoners, including mugshots and fingerprinting. From the police station, they were transported to the mock prison, even being strip-searched as they arrived. The small mock prison cells held three prisoners each. Down a small corridor was the prison yard, a closet for solitary confinement, and a bigger room across from the prisoners for the guards and warden. The prisoners were confined to the cells and yard 24-7 until the end of the study. The guards worked in teams of three for eight-hour shifts and were not required to stay on site after their shifts ended. Those designated as guards had greatly differing responses to the situation. Those who were aggressive felt that they were doing the bidding of the study's organizers. Others felt sorry for the prisoners. Zimbardo's assistant, or warden, David Jaffe, encouraged the more lenient characters to adopt a get-tough attitude. The study began uneventfully. On day two, prisoners in cell one blockaded their cell door with their beds, refusing to come out or follow guards' instructions. Guards from other shifts volunteered to come off duty and assist in subduing the revolt, which they did by attacking the prisoners with fire extinguishers. To counter the fact that each guard shift was outnumbered, one of the guards suggested they keep prisoners in line with psychological warfare. Prisoners who behaved were to be given special meals, and better all-round treatment than those who resisted. 
35 hours in, prisoner 8612 flew into a rage, screaming and cursing and demanding to be released. He was treated indifferently before eventually being released from the experiment. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing and please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Stepping up their psychological warfare, guards forced the prisoners to repeat their prisoner numbers, aimed at assaulting their identity. Mistakes were punished by harassment or protracted physical exercise. Sanitary conditions declined rapidly. Prisoners who displeased the guards were not allowed to urinate or defecate anywhere except in a bucket placed in their cells, which would not be emptied. Mattresses were also removed as punishment, leaving prisoners to sleep on concrete. Further punishments included forced nudity. Guard cruelty escalated with every new punishment. The study concluded that one-third of the guards had sadistic tendencies, while others became caught up and corrupted by the situation. Zimbardo himself became sucked into the unreality. On day four, there was a rumour amongst the guards that the released prisoner was planning to come back team-handed and forcibly release the others. The prison was disassembled and moved onto a different floor of the building. Zimbardo waited in the basement for the imagined mob to show up to convince them that the experiment had been ended. When they never came, the prison was returned to its original location. Prisoners seemed to have similarly taken on their role. Many spoke of parole or getting out, appearing to forget that they could leave at any time. The turning point came when the replacement for the prisoner who had departed was brought into the study. Prisoner 416, with a fresh pair of eyes, immediately complained about treatment and conditions. The guards were furious, and when 416 refused to eat his sausages, announcing that he was on hunger strike, he was placed in the solitary confinement cupboard. The other prisoners were forced to bang on the door and shout to further intimidate him. The guards then tried to introduce collective punishment for any misbehaviour. As the experiment descended into chaos, Zimbardo's girlfriend, who arrived to conduct research interviews, told Zimbardo that she found the experiment objectionable and immoral. After six days, on the 20th of August 1970, Zimbardo called the whole thing off. In his conclusions... Zimbardo thought that the prison system, rather than personality traits, had caused participants to act as they did. He also cited cognitive dissonance, the theory that individuals under stress will do things they otherwise would find objectionable. The ethics and conclusion of the study were widely attacked. It was alleged that much of the behaviour was as a result of the direct intervention and encouragement of Zimbardo and others, as well as the so-called Hawthorne effect. In layman's terms, that the participants were playing to the gallery. In an unintended way, the study seemed to validate some theories outside its original remit, whilst not appearing to validate Zimbardo's own conclusions. Some good did come from the study, it was used to change the way youth offenders were treated in the U.S. prison system. Overall, though, it was lightly regarded as science, with Zimbardo eventually admitting in 2018 that it was more demonstration than scientific experiment. Perhaps its greatest value is to the layman rather than the scientist. In 2020, of all years, it is a timely reminder of how hysteria and the degradation of others can drive some of us to indefensible mental or physical cruelty towards our fellow human beings.
The New Mexico State Penitentiary Riot was the most violent revolt in U.S. prison history. It took place on the 2nd and 3rd of February, 1980. By the time police regained control, after 36 hours of mayhem, 33 inmates were dead and over 200 injured. The prison had been a tinderbox waiting to catch fire. Serious overcrowding had long been a problem. Close to 1,200 prisoners were in the facility on the night of the riot. The prison was designed for only about 950. Many prisoners slept on the floor in dormitories, and first-time offenders, convicted for minor crimes, were not segregated from some of the worst criminals in the state. Recreational and educational programs had been dropped in 1975, resulting in longer lockdowns for inmates and deepened rage against the prison system. Conditions were horrendous. The food was poor. Cell blocks were infested with vermin and cockroaches. Officer brutality was a problem. Inmates reported being kicked and struck when being transferred between different areas of the prison. A work strike against poor conditions in 1976 saw prisoners tear-gassed, stripped naked, and beaten with axe handles. Prison authorities deliberately set inmates against each other in a policy known as the snitch game. A so-called snitch jacket would be placed on troublesome prisoners or to coerce those inmates thought to be in possession of information that would be useful to inform on others. Inmate-on-inmate inmate violence increased and scores would be settled once the riots began. The understaffed guards felt threatened during night counts. As a result, security procedures were not adhered to. Doors were left open to facilitate a quick escape in the event of trouble. On the night of the riot, prisoners had been drinking hooch they had made on the unguarded blocks. The plan had been hatched during this time, the idea being to jump the guards on the 1am count if they didn't lock the door behind them. Sure enough, the door was left open and the prisoners pounced, seizing three officers making the count and the officer manning the cell door. The rioters headed straight for the control room and despite the glass being supposedly bulletproof, smashed their way in. They now had complete control of the prison and access to every key. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. The two main gangs in the prison, the Chicanos and the Aryan Brotherhood, settled scores as soon as they were released. A group known as the Execution Squad, headed for cell block 4, were informers, sex offenders and other prisoners that had been marked for death were held. Stopping along the way at the psychology wing to load up on drugs, which they either consumed or shared out for later, they were high and thirsty for revenge when they arrived at cell block 4. However, they didn't have the correct keys for the cells. It seemed as if the block 4 prisoners would be saved. Unfortunately for them, contractors working on renovations to cell block 5 had left behind oxyacetylene torches, which the prisoners used to break in. The terrified inmates in cell block 4 had to listen as the mob got closer and closer to getting into their cells, one by one. Block 4 inmates screamed desperately to the state police outside, as there was a back door that could have been opened, potentially facilitating an escape. But the state police had agreed with hostage negotiators not to enter, since it may have prompted the rioters to harm or kill the officers who were still being held hostage. They watched on helplessly as a total of 16 inmates were tortured and killed by about noon on Saturday morning. Later that afternoon, a fire that had been started in the gymnasium spread to cell block 3, threatening three of the officer hostages who were being held there. This intensified negotiations, 
which the prison authorities had initiated about 2.30am on the Saturday morning. The prisoners demanded reform of conditions, that no charges be brought against them, and to be interviewed by the media. The authorities wanted the safe release of all hostages. Negotiations broke off on Saturday evening, resumed on Sunday morning, and by mid-afternoon, the riot was over, officers had been released, and police entered the prison. Water and fire damage was extensive. Then the police came upon the horrific scenes of the remains of the murdered inmates, many of whom were too badly disfigured to be immediately identified. New Mexico's Attorney General was commissioned to report on the riot, and his findings ran to 200 pages. He concluded that the prison regime had made violent criminals even more brutal. It also emerged that the riot was orchestrated by a small number of inmates, and that the vast majority of prisoners were actually trying to flee the mayhem for their own safety. Not all of the 33 deaths were murders. A number of inmates had died from drug overdoses. Several prisoners were charged with murder. None were convicted due to a lack of evidence. There were convictions for other offences. The longest sentence added for the riot was nine years. No discernible change in prison conditions took place in the aftermath. It wasn't until a change of governor in New Mexico that any meaningful reforms occurred in the years following the riot. The building continued to deteriorate and the penitentiary was slowly wound down, then eventually closed in 1998. In 2013, the building was open for visitor tours. The New Mexico State Penitentiary stands as a monument to brutality and inhumanity, both from the authorities and from inmates who rampaged out of control for 36 hours, displaying how far humans can sink into the depths of depravity. In April 1993, the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, better known as Lucasville, was the scene of one of the most serious prison riots in US history. Over an 11-day standoff, more than 450 inmates went on a rampage that would end with one corrections officer and nine inmates dead. The riot began on Easter Sunday, the 11th of April 1993, in cell block L. The genesis of the trouble was a familiar one, issues of overcrowding and poor management. Added to that was an explosive grievance among Muslim prisoners who objected to undergoing tuberculosis testing as the process violated their beliefs concerning the consumption and handling of alcohol. As a result, an unusually united and dangerous coalition of groups came together. The Aryan Brotherhood, Gangster Disciples and the Muslims formed a leadership council that exerted total control over the facility for the duration of the standoff. At the time, Lucasville was Ohio's only maximum security prison, so the inmates were composed of the most dangerous convicted criminals in the state, concentrated in one place. In the initial melee, eight prison guards were taken hostage. Then came the score settling. Within hours of the riot starting, five inmates who had been labelled informants, were beaten to death, their bodies placed in the prison yard. Over the next several days, four other inmates would be brutally murdered by the rioters. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Lines of communication were set up between the Leadership Council and the authorities, who had gathered with police units outside. Early on, the Council also demanded access to the media to publicise their grievances and demands. Two of the Muslim leaders were allowed in the recreation yard to negotiate with two prison officials. 
sitting across a table from each other, a microphone broadcast their conversation live to TV and radio stations across Ohio. Throughout the early part of the crisis, prisoners felt their demands weren't being taken seriously and discussed killing a prison guard to send a message. No final decision had been taken when on the 15th of April, an inmate acted on his own initiative, strangling guard Robert Vallandingham. On the same day, a police helicopter crashed near the prison, although the occupants survived. Governor George Voinovich, whose father was ironically the architect who designed the prison, called in the National Guard when it appeared that things were getting out of hand. The prison was located in a rural area, supposedly to disincentivize escape. This meant that the National Guard, at times 1,000 strong, were forced to bivouac in fields, barns, and anywhere else they could find. Following the murder of the officer, negotiations intensified. Officials agreed to review the complaints of the inmates, including the religious objections. By this time, around 350 inmates had walked out of the prison, leaving around 60 still inside. After a release of five hostages late in the day of the 20th of April, the remaining prisoners surrendered. When authorities and the media entered the facility, they discovered the rioters had caused more than $40 million in damage. The smell of burnt mattresses was said to have lingered in the building for years afterwards. The inmates believed that during the negotiations, they had secured an amnesty, but 50 inmates faced charges, 47 of whom were convicted. Five inmates, known as the Lucasville Five, were sentenced to death for their role in the mayhem. They have protested their innocence, but remain on death row. Following the crisis, the Ohio government spent millions of dollars to improve the state's prisons. But as hard economic times hit the U.S. in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the state reduced much of this additional funding. The state also agreed to pay a total of $4.1 million in compensation to the families of the inmates who were murdered. The Lucasville Riot illustrates again the age-old conundrum of prison systems everywhere. Where is the fine line between the ethical and humane treatment of prisoners and legitimate punishment of dangerous, unreformable psychopaths? Straying too far either side of that line costs lives.